Welcome to part six, worm composting, also known as vermicomposting. One key thing to know about vermicomposting is it is all about the surface area. So the process relies on a type of earthworm that rises to the surface to consume the materials. So depth is not a factor like in hot composting. In fact, you don't want big deep systems because they can get hot. So um, this process relies on not only earthworms, but also a wide range of microorganisms that eat the materials and convert them into this valuable soil amendment we call vermicompost. And vermicompost is a higher value than regular compost, which is amazing. So the physical characteristics of vermicompost is that it's fine, got a fine particulate structure, it's granulated, um, it has a higher water holding capacity, it has higher nutrient holding capacity, it results in accelerated germination of your plants, seedling growth, early flowering, uh, the pH is near neutral, so you've got a lot of plant available nutrients, it's full of plant growth hormones, so vermicomposting is amazing. You don't have to worry as much about oxygen as you do with hot composting. The worms come up for air. The bedding that you put them in should be fluffy. So let me just go through some kind of key differences. So uh, vermicomposting utilizes worms and bacteria mostly. Hot composting use, utilizes, um, in addition to bacteria, also utilizes the heat-loving organisms like fungi and other microorganisms. The temperature range for worms is usually between 55 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Think about it is what we would like. We don't like to be you know, freezing. We don't like to be above 85 degrees. Um, so your worms are the same way. The moisture content in your worm bins is actually higher at 70, 90%. The process is quicker. You can have finished compost within 30 days. Whereas for hot composting, you know, it's minimum two months, six months is even better to let it, uh, hot composting, to let it cure and finish. Vermicomposting is passive aeration. The worms do not like vibration and turning, whereas with hot composting, aeration and turning is highly recommended. And again, the surface area is important, not volume, and in hot composting, volume is important. So one good source of vermicomposting is um, North Carolina State Extension, and uh, we'll be sharing the link with you. Rhonda Sherman is amazing. She's been my mentor for more than a decade. And so how to troubleshoot, how to build a bin, you'll find many resources on this website. There's a lot of misinformation on the web. So I am sending you to a reputable site for more information. But basically some earthworm facts. Um, let's understand our little workhorses. They're an animal, not an insect. They can't shiver, so whatever the ambient temperature is, that's what they are. If you're cold, they're cold. They do not produce their own natural heat. So you really have to facilitate a com comfortable temperature for them. The air exchange goes through their skin. They don't have lungs, they don't breathe. And, um, and that's why they need moisture. So the only way for them to, to do that air exchange is if their skin is moist. They're hermaphroditic, meaning that they have both genders. They have sperm and egg, but they don't self-reproduce. It does take two to tango. Um, they have this band that you may be familiar with, and in mature worms, the band is closer to the front. They do not have eyes, but they have light receptors. So you need to protect them from the light. So you don't want a bin that's clear. You want a bin that doesn't have the light coming in. Um, if you've ever, after a rain, seen the worms like on the sidewalk and you're like, why don't they crawl back to the grass over there? It's because they get paralyzed by light after about 40 to, to um, 60 minutes an hour. So that's why, you know, you'll join me. This is me holding a bunch of worms after a rainstorm, picking them up and throwing them back into, um, into the earth. So they have teeny tiny mouths. They're like, they hoover microorganisms and they poop them out. So they're like little factor microorganisms, beneficial microorganisms factories. So they're, they're just 
their guts are teeming with microorganisms. They're amazing. And that's why they can do so much to help soil and plants. And that's why vermicomposting is so valuable. So I just want to share that there are categories of worms, like there's marine worms, uh, those that kind of invade our bodies. But we're talking about earthworms. And most people think earthworms are alike. They are not. And it's really important to get the right kind. You cannot just go out to your garden and dig out earthworms. So scientists have divided them into these three different categories, depending on what they like to eat and where they live. So the epigeic is what we're interested in. They're the litter feeders, the litter, litter not being litter like trash, but like leaf litter that drops, you know, drops and falls. They're living under that leaf litter um, and they do not burrow. So if you go out to your garden and get earthworms like the endogeic worms that live in soil and burrow, um, if you get the wrong worms, they are not going to rise up and eat your food scraps. And then there's the type that are anaseic that live in soil and they have extensive vertical um, burrows. So get the right ones. Epigeic worms that we want do not live in soil. So Isenia fetida is the number one species of worms used around the world for vermicomposting. They respond to a wider variety of environmental conditions. They breed, they move in captivity. Um, one way to make sure that you're getting the right type is to use the scientific name. They're um, commonly referred to as red wigg wigglers, but by Isenia fetida and watch out for um, shady internet sellers. Counting worms is not fun, so always start with at least one pound. And because it's a surface area, you're going to add one pound to one square foot of surface area of bin. Um, they're the top feeders. So we want more vo um, with more volume, the bin could get hot. So if you are in a tropical area, there are species of worms that will thrive in a tropical area, night African night crawler, the blue worm, the Alabama or Georgia jumper. So you have some other other options. They will eat 25 to 30 percent of their body weight daily. So um, keep that in mind. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But do get worms from a reputable source. These are three that I know of. Um, and we will share the links with you. So when you order your worms, they're going to come in a box like this. They'll be in some bedding that they probably don't like to eat. So they're a little bit, you know, asleep, if you will, when they're being shipped. But you're going to gently drop them into the top of the bin. They're, leave your bin open. They're going to move away from the light. So you don't need to touch or help them. Helping will only tear their skin. So um, they're, they're great motivators. So what kind of bin should you get? Well, you have options, just like with hot composting. You can buy a bin off the market. There's many available, or you can make your own. But basically, they all have the same principle where you've got these trays and the worms, you're putting the bedding in one tray and feeding them in one tray. And then as that tray is converted to the vermicompost, you stop, you make new bedding in the tray above it and start putting your food scraps there and the worms will just migrate up to where the food is. And then you'll be able to harvest this bottom tray. Um, some of them have spigots to drain off the liquid. The liquid comes from the food scraps giving up, breaking down and giving up their liquid. And some do not. Uh, some have solid legs, some have more wobbly legs. So that could be a factor in your decision. And of course you can build your own. I've seen benches, seen somebody repurpose a bathtub. Worms need bedding. This is a good time with the fall leaves. You could use fall leaves. You could use newspaper, uh, shred it, tear it. You do need to soak the bedding and drain it before adding to the worm bin. Um, the worms are more picky than the microorganisms in the hot pile. So fruit and vegetable scraps, great. Eggshells are actually okay. Um, they're good for the worms have gizzards and so it helps they need some grit in there coffee grounds paper filters are okay tea bags no staples and you really want to avoid e even more materials than in hot composting you want to avoid the meat grease bones dairy products definitely cat dog feces they don't like hot peppers anything in the onion family in the garlic family uh, no citrus fruits or rinds avoid very salty or sugary foods 
avoid fruit pits, fresh grass. Um, the reason you um, don't want sugary foods that can attract ants, uh, pet feces can have pathogens. Um, what about flowers, you may say? Well, it just takes up space. And these are our princesses. So, you know, if you have a lot of yard trimmings and things like flowers, a backyard bin that gets hot is bigger and more forgiving. Um, so the reason we avoid tomatoes too is it tends to be too acidic. You know, citrus can fall in this category too. And if the pH is too acidic, you could attract red mites, which are not good. They're very parasitic to elderly and sick worms. Peat moss too is acidic, so avoid that. You can store your fruit scraps, by the way. You can put them in the freezer. So the worms will just avoid the frozen stuff and go feeding when it's, um, when it's ready. So I know I'm over time. For those of you who need to go, uh, feel free. This will be recorded. You will be shared the link and I will stay and just know I will answer your questions um, um, till we get through most of them for at least 15 minutes. So my apologies if, for those of you who need to go. All right, so chop your food scraps. Worms do not have teeth. Particle size is more important for worms than in hot composting. And homogeneity is also more important. They're a little picky eaters. So you can't just throw a bunch of, of tough broccoli stalks. They won't like it. In fact, it's a, if you have kids, it's a good uh, science project with your kids. Put the broccoli stalks on one side of your bin and put your chopped watermelon rinds on another and you will see which side the worms will eat. It will not be the, the uh, broccoli stalks, I guarantee it. Okay, so how much food scraps can you feed your worms? As I mentioned, they only eat in their, if you have a pound of worms, how, man, how many food scraps can you feed them a day? Only a quarter to a third of a pound of food scraps a day. So they're gonna multiply. So as your bin increases in the number of worms you have, um, you're gonna be able to feed them more. And you want to make sure that they eat the food scraps that you've given them before you give them more food scraps. So if you have two pounds of worms, you can only give them half a pound of fruit and vegetable scraps a day. They can't consume more than 25 to 35% of their weight. All right, so I mentioned that vermicomposting is all about surface area. You're gonna wanna add your vegetable and fruit scraps in thin layers to the top. The earthworms live in the three in the top three to six inches, and then they're gonna move up as the new kitchen scraps are added. And just some tips, keep, keep, um, uh, keep um, you know, monitor your temperature, keep the bedding moist by misting, never cover your worm bin with like a sheet of plastic, which cuts off oxygen. These bins that you can buy have holes in the top and you wanna wait until all the food scraps are eaten before piling more on top. So this is kind of a schematic of what it looks like, how they rise. This is a finished compost. So this is a tray that's done. Um, and then uh, there's different methods for separating the worms and the finished compost. You do not need to pick out the worms. Again, you don't really wanna touch their sensitive skins as much as possible. So one method is, um, is um, you know, if you're doing this, this separation, as I mentioned before, you just, it's kind of vertical separation. You stop feeding, they rise to the next layer of bin. Uh, this is another one called light uh, separation. They don't like light. So you can kind of make these pyramid piles. Uh, you wait a minute or two, the, the worms go into the pile. You kind of scoop out the top. They keep going down. You can combine piles till you have one or two piles left. And when you turn that one pile over, it's the one that's full of the worms. So, um, all right, so I am concluding now with just some helpful tips and then we'll get to your questions. But for hot composting, you wanna turn, fluff, add air, check moisture, have your browns on hand. You wanna balance those browns and greens. Um, beware of popular bins that are too small. They tend to be, those tumblers tend to be cheaper, but they're not as good, it won't get hot. And you need to cure your compost. Vermicomposting, you don't turn your bin. You feed, smaller, feed them smaller pieces. Don't feed more until the last feeding is consumed. And for both, always cover your food scraps. 